what I'd like to hear from, from the panel is uh, best practices relative to the delivery of uh, concurrent chemo radiotherapy. Again, it all comes down to communication amongst the team, um, you know, and, and it has to be continued communication with the team as well as with the patient and their family. Our patients see either myself or my nurse practitioner on a weekly basis, so it's, it's just really predominantly making sure you're on top of everything and communicating it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think mm -hmm. as physicians, we're in charge of navigating this team and, ex and under helping your practitioners, um, your physician's assistants, your nurse, your MAs understand this is what we expect and this is the best practices out there available. I'm a big proponent of patients starting a proton pump inhibitor. I ever since I've instituted that many years ago, I've seen a big difference in side effects, just tolerability, especially with the esophagitis, the appetite, the weight loss. I mean, I haven't put a feeding tube in patients in years now. And just being proactive, and I, I love that approach about meeting with the patients weekly, working together as a team in that setting. We can talk about nutrition consultations with the patients, but they kind of get that when they go over to supportive care yeah. also. Um, so that's, that's, they have a nice setup. I think where you meet the supportive care physician, you meet a physical therapist, and you meet with a nutritionist all at once when you go over for a consultation. And it's, it's really that holistic approach. I think from the radiation standpoint, it's important to remember, try not to stop or break treatment. I think that we need to remember this is potentially curative therapy and we need to be comfortable with the grade three toxicity. And yeah. just because you see one doesn't mean you have to break. Um, if we give um, appropriate management, you can treat through almost any grade three toxicity. There was early data in the days of concurrent, I'm old enough to remember this, that, uh, that followed the paradigm of no pain, no gain. There was actually an mm -hmm. association between yeah. esophagitis and long-term outcomes. And so I, I do mm -hmm. tell the patients that just because you have a grade three, I think that's an excellent point, just because you have a grade three toxicity doesn't mean we want to stop um, or that that's a bad thing. I think palliative care is a term that some people are afraid of. It causes some anxiety because they think it means end of life care. And what palliative care or supportive care actually is, is an extra layer of support for patients that focuses on symptom management. So um, we spend time with the patients to really get to know them, figure out what's exactly going on. Um, that way that we fix the problem rather than just being dated. It's more individualized, I think, than protocol driven. Um, so we really spend a lot of time with our patients to improve their symptom management and improve quality of life. And I think we have a very famous study, at least in stage four mm -hmm. disease, where palliative care really added to a lot of very important endpoints uh, in non-small cell lung cancer. So uh, I think if you have the opportunity to, mm -hmm. to engage uh, palliative care or supportive care service, it could be really of value. In a, in a mm -hmm. setting where we, we would all admit the potential to have severe toxicity is not insignificant. So prospectively engaging would, would, would be important. And I too often, you know, start patients on a PPI as well as carophate or sucralfate in an effort to reduce a lot of the esophagitis. We start pain medications mm -hmm. fairly early because you know by week three mm -hmm. they're going to start yes. having a lot of these issues. And IV fluids, I build it into their chemo plan and tell them, hey, you guys are going to be getting this mm -hmm. because it's it's going to be a problem. I I tell them you know often that they need X amount of calories we really monitor their weight their albumins and things like that actually help getting the patient through the course of chemo and radiation right. one of the messages that I think is important is that to your point if it's not getting better then you need to start thinking about other like herpetic esophagitis candidial yeah. and this is a point that I wanted to make you mentioned mm -hmm. proton pumps mm -hmm. pump inhibitors I'm, I'm a big believer in antifungal Therapy. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're inducing a mucosal break. You get, we're, we're giving them high dose steroids mm -hmm. yep. weekly with the paclitaxel. Yep. So they're kind of a mm -hmm. setup. And I've seen some amazing responses to diflucon in terms of esophagitis. I start gabapentin along with the PPI um, mm. because that can really help with the burning component of esophagitis. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. And it can lessen your need for narcotics. Mm -hmm. As radiation oncologists, we really can sort of predict what the toxicities are going to be because we've done the radiation plan, we know mm -hmm. where the dose is. For example, somebody with a bulky subcarinal node, we know that they're going to be at high risk for esophagitis because there's a, a bigger volume of the esophagus that's getting the full dose. So if you have a conversation after the treatment planning process, you can say, well, I think this person is at particular high risk of esophagitis. Let's be proactive, you know, and, and it could be different on each individual case.